Great. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Levy Lecture. My name is Wendy Cromash, and I am delighted to welcome you to today's lecture. We are going to learn all about dark money. Uh, so let me uh, get right into it. Thank you, Levy Senior Center Foundation, for your gracious support. Without your assistance, uh, we would not be able to have these lectures. Let me tell you about Julie Strauss. Julie is a, she has a PhD from Northwestern University. Uh, she's a popular lecturer whose passion is teaching adults. She specializes in American politics and covers diverse course offerings, including all of the recent presidential elections, the first 100 days of the Trump administration, major Supreme Court decisions, and the role of media in politics. She's conducted classes in a variety of settings for over 20 years, including retirement facilities, community centers, and several Rhodes Scholar seminars. That's R-O-A-D, seminars. Uh, she brings both academic expertise and real world, world experience to her lectures. Uh, her dissertation from Northwestern examined the unique role women members of Congress have had on public policy. She spent two years on Capitol Hill working for elected officials prior to going for her doctorate. Her undergraduate degree is in social science from Wesleyan. She lives in Evanston with her husband and two children. Julie, welcome. I am going to make myself disappear and I will see you in about an hour to handle the Q&A. Terrific. Wonderful. Thank you for that lovely uh, introduction and uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here to discuss what is a very uh, challenging topic and one that I think um, we all want to understand a little bit better. So let me just tell you where we're going today and how we're going to get there. So uh, to start off, I'm going to uh, focus on some uh, history of uh, campaign finance laws and how they've evolved in our system uh, and particularly focusing on the Citizens United decision and what that has led to in the last uh, uh, 12 years since it was handed down. Uh, so we will talk about uh, how all of this evolved and we'll talk about super PACs and dark money and uh, uh, all kinds of, um, kinds of groups that can influence our elections. Uh, then I want to spend a little time talking about the consequences of this system and what seems to be emerging from this that we can, we can see what are some uh, laws that might be enforced potentially uh, and why are they not uh, if they aren't? Uh, and then finally, we'll talk a little bit about where the public falls on this and some public opinion polls and how we might fix uh, the system if we were in that uh, place. So I'm gonna do a screen share for a few slides and um, I'm going to do this and it's going to take a two-step process because this is how I have figured this out. So uh, we're going to just start with a quote uh, that has been attributed to Justice Brandeis, but I've learned since uh, working on this talk that uh, no one can actually nail down that he exactly said these words, but he definitely had these uh, opinions. So full disclosure, we're going to um, uh, no, that uh, no one can document exactly, but I think the the sentiment is is true and is clear. And he is attributed with saying this, so we'll go with that. Uh, that you could either have a democratic society, or we can have the concentration of great wealth in the hands of the few, but we cannot have both. And he said this uh, likely in the last uh, about a hundred years ago. He sat on the. Um, court from 1916 to 1939, so somewhere in there. Uh, so um, just, just a place to start that we were 100 years ago thinking and talking about these issues, and we still are. 
so um, the first uh, place I want to start, though, actually goes way, way back, which is to 1757 with uh, George Washington, um, who, uh, all right, now, no, went too fast. Okay, sorry, um, who uh, was running for the Virginia House of Burgesses in 1757. And I found this was the earliest uh, painting I could find of him. So we don't know exactly what he looked like in 1757. Uh, but he reportedly paid $195 for punch and hard cider for his friends prior to an election. So even back in the 1750s, he was running for the, uh, the Virginia House of Burgesses, as I mentioned. Um, that he was offering food and drink to his colleagues or his peers who could vote. We know those were white landed gentry men uh, and wink, wink, nod, nod, have some hard cider and please vote for me. And so this is not a brand new phenomenon where there's some sense of perhaps some exchange along these lines. And almost immediately, uh, the, the Virginia legislature uh, banned candidates from giving voters money, meat, drink, entertainment, or provision, any present gift, reward, or entertainment in order to be elected. So they were pretty quick to say, this is not okay. Uh, maybe if he had put out vegetables instead of meat, he would have been okay. But um, even back in the earliest days, even before the founding of the nation, people were uh, running their campaigns in this way. Okay, so we are now going to, I'm going to stop the share for a few minutes, and um, we're going to go now jump way forward to uh, the, uh, the mid-70s in the post-Watergate era. Uh, Congress had a little bit more of a uh, spine, shall we say, where they passed some pretty aggressive campaign finance bills, uh, one round in 1971 and then another round in 1974, the Federal Election Campaign Act. And this uh, key act, uh, it contained three, it was obviously very complicated, but we'll be uh, cut to the chase, which they included limits on how much money an individual, a political party, or a political action committee could donate to a campaign and how much a candidate could then set, spend on their own campaign and receive from other people. And finally, they set up the Federal Election Commission, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, and so this was an attempt to try and regulate the money in the system, obviously in the wake of some uh, uh, illicit campaign activities, and um, that it was an attempt to, as Jeffrey Stone puts it, who is um, a law professor at the University of Chicago and, and, and very uh, prolific writer on constitutional issues, I highly recommend his, his writings, um, that he kind of put it in the context of just as we have the idea of one person, one vote in the Constitution, this was an idea to say one person, one dollar. So you had limits on how much you could donate, limits on um, how much any one person could give you, and uh, even limits on how much you could give your own campaign, even if you happen to be wealthy. Okay. Uh, now we're going to jump forward uh, two or three more years to 1976, where there was a Supreme Court decision, Buckley versus Vallejo, which was found, uh, filed by Senator, then Senator James L. Buckley, who was actually the big brother of William F. Buckley. And they challenged the uh, limits that the Federal Election Campaign Act put on uh, certain aspects of campaigning. And I'm going to go back to my screen share here. And they um, uh, particularly focused on two key things that we're going to focus on today. And that was um, one was the... Um, Okay, now it's not advancing. This is fun when this happens. Okay, so the first one um, has to do with how much you can give to your um, to yourself, and the way that they um, 
limited this with the uh, Supreme Court decision was that they found that it was actually um, unconstitutional and a violation of your First Amendment rights to limit how much you can give yourself in a political campaign. So if you happen to be wealthy and you want to spend your money on your own campaign, the state, in this case, Congress, cannot step on that right. That's a First Amendment right. That's speech. And therefore, you cannot limit that. Um, they did not touch the limits that you could raise from other people, but you could, uh, and that was still left intact, but the amount that you could give yourself was unlimited at this point. And that was, so that was point number one. And the point number two was that you could also have what was called independent expenditures. And that's the key word here is independent. And we're going to focus on that for this hour too, that's gonna to come back, which is that you can, as long as I wrote in the bottom line of the slide, as long as it is independent of a campaign, you can raise as much money as you want. So these uh, coming out of Buckley versus Vallejo, if I was here 15 years ago giving this talk, this is where we would be. We would talk about individuals can donate limited amounts of money to PACs, campaigns and parties. Um, and that is called hard money. And that is uh, $2,000 per election or $2,500 per election. Um, and that is disclosed to the Federal Election Commission, to the campaigns. Everyone can find out that Julie Strauss gave a certain amount of money to a campaign, to a PAC, to a political party. That is hard money. Um, the same for the PACs. Uh, the second thing that you can do is you can donate to political parties. And that is also hard money. That is a higher amount. Uh, I believe it's changed quite a, over the years, but $17,000, $20,000 a, a, a year to the campaign, the political parties, excuse me. And that is also hard money. But there are ways to donate to the political campaign, to the political parties that is also called soft money. And that is uh, less well documented, but it also cannot be spent on certain things. It can only be spent in certain ways. And then this fourth category, a fourth group is the independent expenditures. And as long as that is independent of a campaign, you can raise and spend unlimited sums of money. So what I wanna do is um, make an example here because I think it is difficult to understand all of this without an example. So I'm going to um, show you that I actually am running for dog catcher of the Levy Center. I understand there's an issue with dogs and you need somebody like me who can round them all up and get them trained and uh, all of this. So I'm running at the Levy Center and I come to all of you as members of the Levy Center and I ask you to donate to my campaign. And you all are very generous and supportive of me doing this. And um, so you can give me $100, $200, whatever you want, uh, whatever you can afford, and that would all be hard money. And I would report that for my, now we're gonna pretend that running for dog catcher is a federal, a federal race. We're just gonna gloss right over that. Um, okay, now what I can do is I happen to have a friend, uh, Wendy here, who is helping me run this campaign. And um, what she could do is not only uh, instead of just being my campaign manager or a donor to my campaign, she could really help me out by setting up an independent expenditure group. And so what she can do is go back to all of you when I'm not around and talk to each of you individually and say, look, I really want to help Julie get elected dog catcher. And so if you give me even more money, I can spend it on her behalf, run ads for her, send out mailers, make sure you know when to vote and who to vote for. Um, and as long as she does not talk to me, 
that is okay as far as the Supreme Court is concerned. That is not considered corruption. It is independent. And there is no limits on how much money you could give Wendy to run an independent expenditure group on behalf of Julie Strauss. So Julie can run and go to lots of groups along around you know, the Levy Center and go talk to different residents and people who use James Park a lot and all these things and try and get more and more hard money. And that works. But Wendy, at the same time, can talk to lots of people and raise even more money uh, as soft money. So since we're on the webinar, if this is not clear, um, you know, send it through the Q&A and I'll try and explain that better. But I think that makes makes it concrete. Now, what would make sense for Wendy to do as head of this independent expenditure group would be for her to go negative against my opponent, Joe Schmo, who doesn't know a dog from a cat, rather than try and build me up because maybe she says something about me that is a little bit exaggerated or a little bit, you know, extreme and we get caught out in some kind of a lie, <clears throat> you know, that I went to veterinary school when I in fact did not or something along those lines. So rather than risk embarrassing her candidate, she would be safer to go on the uh, negative and try and take on Joe Schmo here, who is, you know, doesn't know a cat from a dog. And even if he did go to vet school and really does know his dogs, it's really hard for him to correct that in the media, number one. And number two, the better part of all of this is what if she says that about him and it's uh, not true and the press, the Evanston Roundtable or somebody comes to me and says, Julie, you know, you're saying your campaign is saying that your opponent doesn't know a dog from a cat. And I would say, that's not my campaign. That's independent. I have no, I'm not responsible for what they say, or what they do. You need to talk to them. And so they're sort of an unaccountable actor in all of this. And it gives the candidate plausible deniability with how this is uh, permeated through the campaigns. So I think that makes it a little bit clearer as to how this all uh, works. Okay, so moving forward now, we are now talking about in 2002, there came along the uh, Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, otherwise known as McCain-Feingold, which you may remember hearing about. Um, and they did some changes in the wake of the Buckley-Vallejo decision in 1976. And so they realized that, you know, this soft money issue is a problem. And so what did they do? They raised the hard money limits so you could give even more money that is revealed and disclosed. You would eliminate or much reduce the soft money donations and prohibited advertisements of any kind uh, by especially corporations or unions within 30 days of a primary election or 60 days of a general election. So this was passed in 2002 and stood for a few years until now moving forward into the uh, 2008 uh, presidential election. You may recall there were a lot of people running for president in 2008 early on. Uh, Barack Obama, of course, being one and Hillary Clinton being others. Anybody who knows the rest and wants to type that in the Q&A, you get a gold star. Um, but nonetheless, there was a group that called the Citizens United Group that made a movie called Hillary Clinton, actually Hillary, the movie. And they wanted to release it on a pay per view basis. Um, in January of 2008. And that was during as the primaries were starting to heat up in the presidential elections. So um, this was considered electioneering communication, which was barred by the McCain-Feingold bill. 
So the question that came before the Supreme Court then when they started to hear this case in 2009 was um, whether or not it was protected speech or if it was a regulated corporate political donation. Um, and in January of 2010, in a five to four decision, the Supreme Court held that as long as, and I'm quoting here, businesses and unions did not just hand their money to the candidates, which would be corrupt, but instead gave it to outside groups that were supporting or opposing the candidates and were technically independent, there's that word again, of the campaigns, they could spend unlimited amounts to promote whatever candidates they chose. And this was written by Justice Kennedy and supported by uh, Robert Scalia, Alito, and Thomas. And the dissenters were Stevens, Breyer, Ginsburg, and Sotomayor. Um, and Justice Stevens wrote in his dissent, uh, he was pretty upset about this decision. And he said that this was uh, went against what the framers uh, had alleged uh, enshrined in the, in, in the Constitution and that the right of free speech was for individual Americans, not corporations, and that to act otherwise was a rejection of the common sense of the American people. He also said that while American democracy is imperfect and has its flaws, absolutely, he said, few, uh, quote again, outside the majority of this court would have thought its flaws included a dearth of corporate money. You know, we have lots of problems in our country with our democracy, but not enough corporate money in politics is not one of the flaws. Um, so this is really, this was a, a real seismic shift. And again, I will go back to, <clears throat> excuse me, Jeffrey Stone, who kind of put a nice little summary of the both sides on this issue. And so what he said is on the losing side, on the dissenting side, and this stems all the way back uh, to the Federal Election Campaign Act that I mentioned at the beginning in the 1970s, that um, they really, Congress passed that to try and even level the playing field. There's limits on how much money you can give because obviously some people have a lot more money at their disposal than others and there should be some limits so that they don't have such a big megaphone that everybody else doesn't get any room to speak uh, and that this is their attempt at that. The other uh, piece of this um, is the um, on the other side of it as um, the uh, majority found that they would argue, look, corporations and unions and other groups are just groups of individuals. And so they have a right to express themselves just like an individual does. And that Congress does not have a compelling interest. This is under the strict scrutiny for those of us who are court watchers. Um, to burden speech in this way, even by corporations and unions. But the other kicker that Jeffrey Stone highlights, which I thought was fascinating, is he said, and again, if we were uh, together, I would ask you, but I'll tell you the answers, uh, not a quiz today. Um, what is the reelection rate of members of Congress? And that is a very high number. In the House, it is about 95, 96% reelection. In the Senate, maybe it's a little lower, 91% chance of getting reelected. And in his view on this decision, he said that the Supreme Court looked at Congress and said, look, you guys wrote this law, the Federal Election Campaign Act, the McCain-Feingold, and yet you're still getting reelected in huge numbers. The, 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 major, the chance of getting reelected is so high. So we're a little suspicious of you doing this. And so um, therefore uh, we are going to um, strike this down because we think you've kind of stacked the deck. And in fact, they called it the fox guarding the hen house. 
So um, that was a really interesting twist on this whole idea. So um, now this brings us really to where, where we are today in the last 12 years. Um, and uh, so this is really uh, something that now we're gonna kind of dive into all of this. And um, so one other fact that I wanna bring into this. So we've got our on independent expenditures now. And um, the other piece of this, which came out actually in a lower court ruling in the uh, 2010 ruling called Speech Now versus FEC, um, was the uh, in the DC Circuit Court of Appeals following the Supreme Court struck down the rules about donating uh, limits now to PACs because you had limits to uh, yourself if you're a wealthy individual. Now they're striking down limits to PACs. So that led to the creation as a term I'm sure you're familiar with of super PACs. And so as long again, as you do not coordinate with your campaign and with the candidate, you can donate as much money as you want to these super PACs. So back to my example of being the dog catcher, before Citizens United, Wendy could have started her own independent expenditure group. Now she could set up a super PAC and that would be just raising as much money, no limits at all, and spend it on my behalf, but not in coordination with me. And so one of the things that happened in the years after Citizens United was a huge number of super PACs took off. And uh, as I'm showing you here, the statistic, the top 1% of super PAC donors gave 96% of the funding or in another, uh, to put it in numbers, uh, 1,562 donors gave $818 million in the 2018 cycle, so four years ago, and that was a midterm cycle, as we know. Um, uh, so uh, you're only talking a very, very, very small number of people who've given almost a billion. And then another statistic is, again, the 10 most generous donors and their spouses. So 20 people in the last 10 years have given $1.2 billion to federal elections in the last decade. So this is really a whole new ball of wax now. And we're not really as focused, although that's another piece of corporations and unions, but now it's really shifted quite dramatically to in wealthy, wealthy individuals who are donating um, to super PACs. So a couple examples of how this all uh, worked. Um, and I'm going to just, uh, well, I'll, I'll keep this open so people can absorb these statistics. So one example of this was in 2012, uh, the Koch Network, David and Charles Koch brothers, they're one of the biggest uh, donors to our political system, spent reportedly uh, $407 million um, on the 2012 uh, presidential uh, and congressional elections. Uh, almost all of it anonymously, and we're going to get into how you can be anonymous in, in a few minutes. And that was more than John McCain spent in the entirety of his 2008 campaign. So $407 million. Another example of this is much more recent, and this is uh, our current president, Joe Biden. So if you can think back to October of 2019, he tried to have a no super PAC pledge, like some of his uh, competitors, particularly Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. But by October of 2019, he was really struggling to raise money, and he was at risk of having to pull out of the presidential election. Um, and um, he had to sit down with his closest advisors and, and such. And they convinced him that really the only way to stay in the race was to set up a super PAC. And um, he did. 
that. And within one week, his uh, supporters had launched Unite the Country. This was run by Democratic strategists and former Biden campaign ads. And the key word there is former. So they used to work for him. They know him very well, et cetera. And within one month of this being set up, they had raised uh, $2.3 million, a lot more than he would have raised uh, from small donors. And they launched ads and they were able to keep him in the race. And you have to remember, again, back in October, uh, November of 2019, it was before the pandemic had started, and there were literally 20 other people running against him. And again, that's your second gold star if you can list them all, but we just can rattle off Buttigieg, Kamala Harris, Bill de Blasio, Beto O'Rourke, um, Elizabeth Warren, Michael Bloomberg, uh, though that was a little later, um, Jay Inslee, um, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand. I mean, the list is endless. I think Mickey Mouse was in there somewhere. Uh, so he is facing all of these and almost Cory Booker. A lot had yet to drop out. They were all hoping to be the one that was going to get them on the path. Um, and um, Biden stays in the mix. And then oh, Iowa happens. It's not very pretty. The app doesn't really work. Pete Buttigieg wins by literally, you know, a half a point or something, and he's not able to claim victory because it was such a mess with the voting and, and the technology. And then um, they go uh, to uh, soon thereafter to South Carolina. Jim Clyburn has this amazing network down there and is able to really put Biden front and center in a decisive uh, victory. And within a few days, everybody drops out except for Bernie Sanders. Then you're at the end of February, early March. We start hearing about something coming out of China um, and what's happening there. And um, he and Bernie Sanders have one final debate, if you may recall this. And they actually did like the elbow bump at that point because we didn't know what was COVID yet and how it was transmitted and all of that. Uh, two years ago. It's hard to believe how much has happened in two years. And um, what did he talk about in that debate? And again, I kudos if you, if you remember all of that. But what did Bernie Sanders want to talk about? He wanted to talk about Medicare for all and what whether they should get rid of Obamacare, whether um, you know, what, what, what kind of health care plan would be better uh, for, the, for the country. And that's not what Biden wanted to talk about at all. Biden wanted to focus on the fact that he was going to um, uh, nominate a woman to be vice president and nominate an African-American woman to be on the Supreme Court. And looking forward, this was what he was going to do as president. This is going to be um, his general election campaign. And Bernie Sanders, you're sort of back in primary land and I, that ship has sailed. And he puts that out there. Bernie Sanders is not quite ready to commit to that. And we all know what happened. Biden wins the nomination. He wins the election. He picks Kamala Harris uh, to be his running mate uh, before he wins the election. And then he, just last week, Katanji Brown Jackson has been elevated to the Supreme Court, fulfilled those two promises that he made um, two years ago. So all of that can be traced back for, you know, there's a lot of factors that went into it, but can be traced back to the power of a super PAC at the right moment, at the right time, but still that is completely unaccountable. We do not know all the funders uh, and is run by people who are close to Biden and know how Biden operates. So they are independent technically, but they are not uh, in the wilderness as far as Biden is concerned. Okay, so let's keep moving in terms of these two other pieces to this. And that is the um, way this now operates. And this is really getting into the weeds. So we'll try to make it clear, but uh, under don't you know understand if it's a little opaque. So um, 
in addition to the super PACs, there are organizations that you can set up or be part of that are, as we all familiar with, um, nonprofit entities that are governed by IRS rules. That's a quite a mouthful, but you have, as I as you can see on the screen, your 501c3s and your 501c4s. So your 501c3s, we all understand, are groups like the Levy Center, nonprofit, tax exempt. They have a religious, charitable, or educational mission. They have to disclose their donors. And um, you uh, can find out who donated to them. You can look at their you know, annual reports and see who, who donated to them. Uh, however, there are ways to set up these 501c3s that can um, pretend or portend to have these missions that um, instead of disclosing the donor names exactly like Julie Strauss, you can set up what's called a donor advised fund where uh, a lot of people can uh, donate into this fund and you can donate to this fund. And that is also tax exempt. So if you want to donate to the donor advised fund, you get your tax write off, but the money sits there as, and it is invested. And you can then dole it out over the next several years or as long as you want to nonprofits. You don't have to spend it all at once. So if you say you have a million dollars that you want to donate for uh, charitable purposes, you can donate it to a donor advised fund. You get the tax write off up front. And then over the next several years, you could give you know, 50,000 here, 100,000 there to different groups. But what's key is that the the way that it's it's uh, disclosed then to those groups is through the donor advised fund. So you don't necessarily know that it's Julie Strauss making those donations. So um, that's one set. The other set are the 501c4s. And those are also tax exempt. They are not uh, mission oriented. They are more or citizen organizations. They are supposed to pr pr primarily engage in social welfare, um, but they can lobby and advocate in pursuit of social welfare. Um, and the key though, is that the donors can remain anonymous. And the other key is that you can transfer funds from your 501c3, perhaps donor advised fund, to a 501c4 that promotes a social welfare mission, but that social welfare mission is very loosely defined by IRS rules. And this is the key. So IRS is understaffed, we know, and is not necessarily in the business of policing these kinds of groups. They're auditing people on their taxes and doing other kinds of, uh, of, of, of uh, investigations. Um, and they have uh, made it sort of clear through lack of enforcement and some of their regulations that um, if the, as, uh, the, these 501c4s, they have to have social welfare as their primary goal, but it has to be, it can, it can be 50% or 49.9%. So half of the money that can be given to these groups can be used in other ways. You don't have to have, it doesn't have to be 95% social welfare. And this whole definition is very, very nebulous. Um, so this is where we're getting into even murkier territory than even the super PACs, where you also can just you know, have some anonymity and some of these super PACs are 501c4s. So you can really um, you know, hide your identities. So one example too that uh, was just written about um, lately in, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, it was uncovered by the New York Times uh, several years ago as this was starting to come to light is that you can um, continually uh, what they call money churn where you can have your hypothetical tax exempt organization. They said, let's call it the good government coalition. 
it has $10 million in revenues, it can fulfill its obligation to spend just over half of its money on non-political activity by giving $5 million plus $1 million to another tax-exempt social welfare organization with an ambiguous name, the Liberty Bell and Alliance. They're putting this in, the, in, in their hypothetical example. And the Good Government Coalition can now spend what it has left, $4,999,000, on political activity. But what's key is then the Liberty Bell Alliance, which now has uh, $6 million in it, can spend, again, just under half, which would be $2.499 million on political activity. So the net result is that of the original $10 million in this example, instead of only 4.9 going to political activity, actually 7.49 goes, or 74%, because you can keep passing this down. I know there are a lot of confusion, so we'll uh, hold the questions uh, to the end, and I will try to explain any clearer if that's a, 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 any confusion. And I understand this is confusing, and I can't say that this is going to be 100% clear, because even the IRS is, is vague about how these are regulated. And that is part of the point, is that is being um, uh, uh, exploited. So, um, and one of the uh, observers of all of this from the more liberal leaning campaign legal center uh, said that the political players who solicit this money, they all know who is in the mix. They all know who to talk to, to raise money, whether you're on the Republican side or the, or the Democratic side. And he said this, uh, their um, uh, rep, uh, Paul Ryan uh, representative said, the only ones in the dark will be American voters. We are the ones who don't know who's giving all the money and where it's going. But if you're in the mix and you're in the know and you're in this area, you know who's donating and how much and where. So a um, couple things I wanna go back and just reiterate back to the um, uh, Citizens United decision. Justice Kennedy, when he wrote the decision, thought that the internet was going to be the ultimate in sunshine, that it was going to, you can't hide anything on the internet. So who donated, who gives this money, you can find that out. You can be intrepid, a reporter, investigative researcher, and find this out. But actually, you can't when, if you go back to the screen that's up here, if you're donating through donor advised funds, and then you're shifting that into a 501c4 where the donors can remain anonymous, there's no amount of internet digging that you can find out exactly who gave what. You can certainly find out a lot. And I would say at this point, I should mention, of course, that there is this book that uh, was the basis. Oh, no, it's backwards. Um, sorry, on the screen uh, by Jane Mayer uh, called Dark Money. And she is a New Yorker reporter. She's done a lot of deep investigations and she really explains how this is all uh, unfolded, but she looks at it really from the libertarian Republican side with a deep focus on the Koch brothers and other families that have gotten enormously wealthy and used this um, mechanism for their own uh, uh, pursuits. Um, and this is the next point uh, that I want to make beyond. So the, so the internet and, and to that point, she did a lot of digging, of course, and a lot of research and was able to uncover a lot of this, but it is still really hard to find out who exactly gave how much. The second thing that the Citizens United decision certainly miscalculated was partly that a lot of this is not corporations and unions, although they have roles to play, these are, again, wealthy, wealthy, wealthy individuals who are really um, uh, influencing our, our, our politics and donate huge sums of money and don't have that accountability. Whereas if you found out that you know Disney or Delta or airlines or some big corporation is donating uh, to one group or the other, they could face some public exposure and maybe some pushback. Uh, if you're just a super wealthy individual that doesn't have that public profile, you can do so much of this way behind the scenes and, and not pay 
uh, a public accountability price for it. And then the last thing that I want to point out on my on my slides here is um, this idea of independence. And this is the last thing, one of the things that they got wrong, I would say, in the Citizens United decision, which is they said, as long as everything is independent, it is not corruption, right? So we back to my example with Wendy and independent expenditures, and then she sets up a super PAC for me to run for dog catcher, and she can't talk to me. We can't converse. We can't strategize. Um, well, that's fine until you have the internet. <laughs> and so one example of this that just happened in the last uh, cycle was that Susan Collins, pictured here on, on the right, is running for re-election in the state of Maine, senator from Maine. And uh, she um, and her campaign uploaded six minutes of soundless, high-resolution campaign footage to YouTube. So who needs to coordinate with her when here's her footage? And what happened was then a super PAC called the 1820 Super PAC uh, pulled down this footage and used it to make a very positive ad for her. This ad was funded almost entirely by Stephen Schwartzman, who is a hedge fund manager in New York State. Uh, he spent $500,000 supporting this uh, ad. And he didn't need to talk to her. All he needed to do was go to YouTube and pull this down and use that to make ads. And it's independent. Nobody can say it isn't, even though, you know, it, there, there is this coordination, but it's out in the public. It's, it's completely, you know, uh, easy. So um, this is really, I think, uh, ha uh, a misunderstanding of many people would say certainly of this idea of corruption and and that it has to be directly changing hands um, rather than this sort of uh, you know through the internet finding ways to connect having former people who used to work for you run your your super packs they know how you work there's ways to communicate you can put your strategy uh, out and in the press and so they can read the press and find out what you're what you're thinking and what you're targeting and how you can how they can be helpful. So this is all um, of a piece. So um, that's, uh, I think, a key uh, sort of takeaway. So let's talk a little bit in the time we have left. Um, I'm going to end the screen share. I hope this was helpful um, to um, talk about what are the what's the the price that we're paying on on all of this as a as a country as a society and and certainly um some people would say that this is not much far removed from having uh uh players football players or tennis players who have logos all over their jerseys and that say you know adidas and rolex and whatnot um, uh, Wilson, what, what have you, that this is what's happening with politicians. And Stephen Schmidt, who is a former Republican, I think he no longer associates with the Republican Party, says that um, the candidates are like football players with their sponsors' name on, names on their jerseys. If you have ever, a single person responsible for your nomination, you owe them everything. You can say not, but it's determinative. Going back to Susan Collins' example, when Stephen Schwartzman calls, you think she's going to duck his calls? Probably not. Um, and then you to quote uh, Betsy DeVos, who a uh, former secretary of education, also from a Michigan family with very, very deep pockets and have been very influential in a lot of this uh, aspect, says, um, quoted in, in, in Jane Mayer's book saying, I know a little something about soft money as my family is the largest single contributor of soft money to the National Republican Party. I have decided, however, to stop taking offense at the suggestion that we are buying influence. Now I simply concede the point. They are right. We do expect some things in return. We expect to foster a conservative governing philosophy of consisting of limited government and respect for traditional American virtues. We expect a return on our investment. We expect a good and honest government. So right there in black and white, there's an expectation and how you're going to fulfill that expectation is uh, something that we need to uh, grapple with. Um, certainly, uh, 
some people really do say that we have now entered the realm of, of an oligarchy uh, that has been written about by Jeffrey Winters, who's uh, on faculty at Northwestern, um, uh, and, and also was uh, uh, Jane Mayer uh, talked with him in, in the book and, and used a lot of his, um, his research in that, in that regard, and that uh, the, this uh, is signified by the fact that you have a population that is relatively small, but very powerful that can use its superior economic position to promote a brand of politics that serves first and foremost itself. Um, so let's look at some of these policy consequences. And I think we could go deeper, but the two biggest uh, examples are really um, uh, gun control and uh, climate change. And on the first side, you have uh, Michael Bloomberg, uh, we know very, very, very wealthy, um, who has been very involved in uh, promoting gun control uh, around the country and spending vast sums of money to promote candidates who support gun control. Um, and since 2010, he has given $163 million to gun control groups. And for the first time in, in 2018, outspent uh, the NRA, uh, focused on state level uh, uh, races, particularly in Virginia in 2019. Um, and we know the NRA is having its own financial issues and is being investigated in New York. So Maybe that's not 100% fair comparison, but nonetheless, he has really pushed this agenda quite a bit. Um, on, uh, and, and yet to have major success in Congress, but I think in the states and electing more people who are sympathetic, uh, that money is, is very powerful. Uh, on the flip side, you have, uh, on the other side, the Koch brothers particularly have been uh, very focused on climate and uh, challenging and changing our understanding of climate change. They are a fuel and gas or a company that originates. They have uh, companies in all directions. And in fact, in the book, she calls them the cocktopus because they're everywhere in, in terms of having interests in lots and lots of industries. But their first one was, was oil and gas. And they are among the largest emitters of greenhouse gases, and they've been regulated by the EPA. Um, and they've uh, chain, taken uh, taken umbrage and had uh, really um, some novel ways of challenging that. So, if you can remember back to 2010. Republicans took back the House of Representatives. Uh, this was the first midterm uh, under Barack Obama. And as he said famously, Democrats got shellacked. And one of the things that came out was there were 85 new Republican members of the House. 76 of them signed a pledge saying that they would not support a climate, the, the, they signed a pledge saying the no climate tax pledge. And this was modeled on the no taxes pledge that Grover Norquist had put forward earlier, but that they would not support any legislation that included uh, cap and trade or any kind of uh, taxes unless it was uh, met with uh, equal and maybe even more spending reductions, which was highly unlikely. And of the 76 who signed the pledge, 57 had received money directly from the Coke Industries PAC. And even though there was attempts at some legislation, uh, they uh, failed and they were um, uh, successful in shrinking the budget of the EPA between 2011 and 2013 in particular. So uh, they definitely had an impact on the climate agenda. And taking it one step further, a uh, leading scholar at Harvard, Theta Scotchpole, a political scientist and a sociologist, uh, wrote a book called The Tea Party and Remaking of, the, of Republican Conservatism. And she found in this book, she did a one piece of it was on climate denial. And she points out that the Republican Party, particularly in Congress, had swung sharply to the right on climate issues. But the partisan differences were small among the general public. But they, she wrote, they grew into a gaping chasm among elected officials. 
Uh, and she also found in doing her research of the Tea Party, which you can then maybe draw something of a line to, to Donald Trump, was that the two biggest issues that resonated was immigration and the EPA. And so that it was has been long predated uh, Donald Trump in, in the early uh, 2010s and, and, and through that decade. Uh, another point uh, was from Michael Mann, who is a leading climate scientist at Penn State University, who uh, took a lot, was very public, and, he, and his support of that we need to do something about climate. And he says, in the scientific community, the degree of confidence in climate change is rising. In the public, it's either steady or falling. And so he says there's a divergence and that wedge is what the industry has bought. So the fact that the scientific community believes it, but the public is, is not believing it as much, that doubt, that challenge, that's where uh, you, get, you get some traction and you can slow down legislation. Um, and so this is, uh, I think, the policy, one example of policy impacts of this whole money system. But taking a step back, I want to uh, take uh, an a even deeper look a little bit at what's, why are we in this situation? And this is where we'll um, uh, kind of try and put a bow on all of this. And a couple things have happened that I think have led to this situation. And one of which is um, the weakening of our political parties. And uh, we have done a lot of reforming of them. We have primaries, we have uh, superdelegates, then we took away the superdelegates. We have uh, trouble uh, figuring out how to nominate people to uh, run for president, uh, whether it's winner take all or it's proportional for delegates makes a big difference. That certainly helped Trump in 2016. Um, so uh, he, the argument that is made, and this is uh, well written in an article by Jonathan Rausch in uh, How American Politics Went Insane, that's an eye-catching headline in The Atlantic, says that the power that the political parties used to have when they could sort of be filters and screen out candidates and screen out messaging, um, that shifted to outside money, much of which comes from donors that are more extreme than the electorate that is electing them. And that moderates had to fear, of course, the primary challenge. And uh, that pulls everybody to the extremes. And then if you do go out on a limb and you want to call out some of this behavior or say, you know, climate change is a threat or, you know, something bad that we should be focusing on as a party, you don't have any party protection. And you're kind of seeing this now, particularly in Congress, where everybody is a political entrepreneur and their messaging um, is, is pretty extreme. And there's very little discipline from the parties when you get out way ahead of your skis. Uh, so, and David Axelrod likes to say that all the time too, is that everybody is a political entrepreneur and uh, they go off message and there's not a lot of party discipline because they've been very weakened. And then these other outside forces, particularly the money forces um, have, have, come, have come into play. So that's one issue. Of course, another issue is lowering faith in government. And as uh, voters, you're looking to Congress to pass laws that you think, you know, the country needs, uh, whether it's climate, whether it's lowering drug prices, whether it's, um, you know, uh, uh, more child care support or what have you. And you see that it doesn't happen cycle after cycle or immigration reform. And you start to really get dispirited and feel like Congress isn't isn't working and isn't doing its job and isn't looking at problems and solving them. It's punting. It's you know going to the extremes, and that is part of the faith that we're losing in our institutions to solve our problems. But part of that is really because there's these other forces that are pulling people. Um, away from moderation, 
and into uh, more sort of extreme uh, positions. And, um, and then as uh, some people have noted, the, um, uh, the, this is a troubling result of Citizens United and that in a time of historic wealth inequality, the decision has helped reinforce the growing sense that our democracy primarily serves the interests of the wealthy few and that democratic participation for the vast majority of citizens is of relatively little value. And that is you know, a very dispiriting message. Senator Whitehouse, a Democrat from Rhode Island, has a more succinct uh, way to put it. Down, put it, he calls that we should uh, that he believes that uh, should crack down on secret spending uh, because dark money and all of these uh, entities have unleashed, in his words, a tsunami of slime that deserves democracy. So we can run with that. So let me uh, just uh, in the last couple minutes, I just want to finish up on one or two last points and then I will open it up to questions. Um, but you may be thinking now, well, is anybody in charge to regulate all of this? And there are some, of course, people, the FEC being one, the Federal Election Commission. Uh, part of the problem, though, and this is uh, infiltrated the FEC, is that they are paralyzed. Uh, there are uh, up to six members, uh, three from both uh, from each party. And uh, do they all agree that today is Tuesday? No. So you need four votes to sanction any campaign or anybody. And the Republicans and the Democrats don't cross and they each will block the other's attempt to sanction. And uh, this is really an ongoing problem, uh, but that one is not easily solved given the partisan gridlock. But even on top of that, even if they could solve that, they really haven't updated their rules either. They don't even talk or have any regulations dealing with super PACs, even though that's been in existence for 12 years. They only look at... Um, uh, television and radio ads. They don't even consider digital ads and what's going on online. Um, they're way out of date in terms of sanctioning and all, all of this. And that all needs to happen, but it first needs to happen with a consensus that this needs to be addressed from both sides of the aisle. Justice Kennedy uh, in 2015 uh, saw this starting to happen and he criticized the Federal Election Commission for not doing more to require politically active groups to disclose their donors. Um, and he said that the Citizens United decision was not working the way it should. So even the author of the opinion is disheartened with how this is all shaken out. But nonetheless, that hasn't changed in the last seven years. Uh, so don't want to leave everyone on a down note. So what can be done, if anything, to address some of this? And clearly, uh, nobody is, is really going to say that we should limit all these donations because the Supreme Court has repeatedly struck that down as a violation of free speech. And as long as you're independent, there's no corruption. And so getting it through this Supreme Court uh, would be really you know, impossible. So the second best option that most people support is some kind of disclosure and uh, that you really uh, have much better reporting of um, who is donating, where they're donating, what that, that allows reporters and people to find out what are their economic interests, what are their political interests, where are they uh, coming from. But um, this is, uh, I think, one-offs uh, and not a, a, a standardized way of regulating and learning about who is giving so much money into the system. And uh, President Biden did propose a bill that would have closed some loopholes, uh, particularly the one of the transferring money from 501c3s to 501c4s, but that was filibustered in the Senate. They've tried, Democrats have tried to uh, pass the Disclose Act, um, which would uh, force uh, all kinds of groups to disclose where they've donated anything more than $10,000. That also has been uh, filibustered. Uh, so that I think is really uh, 
not um, moving and, and unless uh, and until there's a change in the filibuster rules or a sense that both sides are paying a political price. And that is one last uh, thing is that actually in 2020, um, Democrats uh, raised more money than Republicans. Um, in the 2020, uh, the New York Times found that they, the Democratic side uh, raised and then spent one and a half billion dollars versus 900 million by the Republican side. Um, and that is more money than the DNC and the RNC raise. So that shows you right there, the weakness of the parties versus these very wealthy individuals. So it is possible that Republicans might say, maybe we don't want this to happen anymore either. And let's get somewhere on this, but I'm not sure that that's uh, likely. And then the sad thing and the last thing I'll leave you with is that actually the public does support, of course, uh, not of course, but does really want to um, support this. And I'll just uh, uh, screen share one last time here to show you um, the polling that was in the Pew uh, Research Center. And this is a little bit uh, old and it was hard to get uh, a ton of polling on this that's super recent, but you can see overwhelming support for limiting uh, how much you can spend and that you should have more laws uh, that were written that would reduce the role of uh, money in politics. So um, I think that there's a lot of public support for this, but uh, again, this feeds into the what I hope I've spelled out, I hope relatively clearly that there's a lot of other forces in our system that are pulling in different directions that we're not sure who they are or how much influence they have that are going to uh, change the narrative and, and push elected officials in other uh, directions. Um, so I hope that uh, this was illuminating. I think it is incredibly important that we understand this better. It's hard to understand it perfectly because it is very complicated and is changing and there are new uh, devices set up and, and ways to funnel uh, support. But I think getting some handle on this is, is critically important. So thank you so much uh, for your time and attention. And I'm hopeful to answer questions, eager to answer questions. Wow. Uh, Julie, thank you. Uh, that was a lot to absorb, but, uh, you know, just about awesome. everybody who started hung in there and we're, um, thank you very much for sharing all of your knowledge and expertise. We have some great questions. I'm going to get right to it. My pleasure. Dars would like to know, is money Trump uh, raising now independent or does he personally own it? Okay, so uh, Trump has super PACs. So he's raising that money through super PACs from uh, contributors. Um, it's a little murky. How does he own it? Yes, can he spend it on things like legal expenses? Uh, I think to some extent, yes, he can. Uh, the RNC is spending some of that on legal expenses. Uh, should he be able to build a house with it? No. Uh, could he and not be completely investigated and sanctioned? Possibly, because I think the enforcement mechanisms are weak, as we've explained. Um, and I should mention that the whole Stormy Daniels uh, kerfuffle, kerfuffle uh, was because of uh, you know, a campaign finance donation that was improperly documented and, you know, Michael Cohen had the, had the checks. So um, it did lead to a big splash and some investigation, but it has yet to really lead to a fine accountability. So um, this is part of the, the murkiness of it. Absolutely. So uh, okay. that's the best I can answer. Kathy would like to know, is there any way to get rid of the recognition of uh, corporations and other organizations as the same thing as an individual in terms of freedom of speech rights? Um, 
I don't think so, given the Supreme Court. Uh, they have really uh, seen this as, you know, everybody should have a role to play in our politics. And it just shows you, I think, the thinking that maybe, you know, far be it for me to criticize, you know, the justices, uh, because, you know, they're, they're much more steeped in all of this, uh, certainly than I am. But the idea that corporations and unions would be equal. And so if you allow corporations to do it and unions to do it, then you're, you know, you're, you're on both sides. And so that's, you know, that's kosher. Um, but now they have all these wealthy individuals uh, who have really jumped in the fray that I don't think they anticipated all of this. And yet, you know, it's not only on one side, there's wealthy individuals on both sides that have been donating tons of money. Um, but uh, I think rolling all of that back, I, I don't see how you could do that. And I will point out that in 1976, it was a completely different court that decided Buckley versus Vallejo, which said that, you know, it's a violation of free speech that you can't, you know, you can donate as much as you want to your own campaign from your own money. And if you happen to be wealthy and you're J.B. Pritzker and you want to give yourself $90 million, you can. So uh, and that's speech. So I it's not just this Supreme Court. It's earlier iterations. Now, again, that was not a unanimous decision, but that's been pretty consistent since 1976. Do you find that the recent um, texts that became public from Ginny Thomas concerning January 6th and um, her, you know, being the spouse of a Supreme Court justice and knowing that Supreme Court justices don't have to recuse themselves if they don't want to. You know, is all of this going to lead to anything? I, I mean, I, I've heard a lot of discussion about um, this kind of thing affecting the legitimate, the legitimacy of the court. And so do you have any thoughts? Yes, uh, that's an excellent question, and uh, you're not alone to ask it. Um, it's yeah, I think you know. Ideally, he should uh, recuse himself um, from cases that have to do with groups that she supported that are coming before the court. Um, it is absolutely true that the Supreme Court does not have a, a code of ethics that it must follow. Everybody, every other court below it must. Um, I, I have perhaps a slim hope that maybe Justice Roberts would try to push that a little bit because um, he does care about the image of the court. And so um, perhaps he will find, he can't make Justice Thomas recuse, but maybe they could put forth a set of ethics guidelines that they all sign on to as a show of, of good faith and they're concerned about the legitimacy of the court. Um, and um, so that seems to me to be the only uh, push that might move them, but there's, I think, a huge chasm uh, in terms of how the court and some of the justices see them, you know, see themselves as being political and, and you know, not seeing it in the same lens as uh, an average person might see it. So I think that's um, really, really tricky. Um, and it's interesting. There was, I just refer you today to the Washington Post. There was an op-ed by um, uh, one of their legal uh, analysts who said that he thought the Republicans sort of overplayed their hand with the Katanji Brown Jackson um, uh, hearings and that when you've kind of won with six to three that you maybe, you know, you back off a little bit and you don't fight the fight as hard because you've already won it and that it it feeds into this notion like you're asking the legitimacy of the court because you're always on the defensive about it. But um, I, I think that this is, uh, we are so deep into this polarization idea and and the, uh, the talking past each other. And I think you see evidence of that 
with this, um, unfortunately. So I don't think that it's going to have a, a major impact, maybe a little bit at the margins with an ethics push. Okay. Um, and just a related question. When you talked about party discipline, um, it would, from my observance, the Republicans in the Senate are very disciplined. And, you know, I don't know, you know, they seem to, to move in lockstep with whatever Senator McConnell wants. Well, yes and no, that's an excellent point. Yes, they move in lockstep with what he wants on filibustering. Yes, he they won't break on, you know, filibustering bills or holding things up. Um, you know, they only got three Republicans to vote for Katanji Brown Jackson, which, you know, was pretty low uh, in general, historically, what have you. But I think you could also make the point that, especially during the hearings, you know, Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, Tom Cotton, um, they're independent operators. And that if you probably got McConnell in a room alone, he probably didn't love, <laughs> you know, all the attacks on her in the sense that, you know, this is, there was definitely flag of QAnon, the whole pedophilia, like, you know, I think that he's, um, you know, not super keen on all of that. And, and so that is, I think, a sign that you have people really going a little bit rogue, but they're doing it for the television cameras and the Twitter mentions and all of that more than on, on policy. Um, I also would mention, though, in the House, and I guess that's it's it's a little more important in the House because, um, you know, you don't have the filibuster as a protection, sort of. So you've got, you know, your Marjorie Taylor Greens, your Madison Cawthorns, your Matt um, Gates, uh, Lauren Boberts, who are just saying absolute bonker stuff. And yet Kevin McCarthy doesn't discipline them. He doesn't shut them down. He doesn't he doesn't even, you know, denounce it. You know, they're going to white nationalist rallies, some of them. I mean, there's a lot going on. And and, um, you know, in, in an earlier era, you would, I think, have found the Republicans and the Democrats, you know, pushing to expel these people, find people to run against them, try to, you know, rid them uh, from the party. And there have been examples of that historically. And now the parties are, are weaker. And that's a big, big piece of this is, is gerrymandering and being pulled uh, to the extremes. Uh, being an incumbent isn't as protective. So you're really even more dependent on deep pockets and on running to the base for your support. Um, and people feeling like the parties, you know, being in closed doors with cigar smoke filled rooms was, was bad. And so now we have everything, you know, open with primaries up the wazoo, but then anyone can run and anyone can win and that, and pull the party in all kinds of directions that are pretty, um, hard to believe given, you know, how anti-communist the Republican party had been through the whole cold war and now, a chunk of them, you know, are 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 praising or not condemning Putin. So I mean, it. I think a lot of that goes back to the um, the political incentives people are responding to, and it's it is fascinating. And this is a piece of it, but it's not the whole. It's not the whole uh, ball of wax. <laughs> Aaron would like to know how do you create a super PAC. You create a super PAC. Well, that's easy. You file uh, some paperwork, you get together with your friends and you raise some money and you decide that you're going to help or hurt some group. And as long as you have deep pockets, um, you can run ads, you can you know, uh, uh, do opposition research, you can uh, do all kinds of things as long as you don't talk to them directly. And like I said, you can do it through the internet. You can read the paper. You can find out where their agenda is, where they're strong, where they're weak, uh, hire some pollsters to figure this out and help or hurt. Um, but basically you need, you know, some, some deep pockets, but it's really easy. As I said, with Biden, they did it in a week. So it doesn't take much. 
Patrick asks, what connections, if any, are permitted between super PACs and the campaigns they support? Yeah, none. It's technically, you're not supposed to coordinate or communicate. But again, I think that's sort of, um, you know, a little misunderstood because you can pick up the paper and you can uh, or easily research a candidate online and find out polling, find out you know, where they've been campaigning. And then if you're trying to help that candidate, you can do some of that research yourself and figure out, okay, well, they didn't quite hit this area. So let's, let's uh, send some ads that way or do some mailers or, you know, run a TV ad on this local, you know, cable, cable channel, whatever. So you, you're not technically coordinating, but you can easily figure out, especially if you're really well versed in campaigning in like North Carolina or Ohio or wherever your specialty is, and you can um, lend your support. But cynically, do you really believe that they don't talk to each other? Well, um, cynically, uh, I would say that, you know, when I was working on Capitol Hill, which was a long time ago, and before Citizens United, if you found out that these those independent expenditure groups, which preceded super PACs, had some connection to somebody in the campaign in real time, that was going to be a bomb that you could, you know, you could drop. Okay. But now I don't think, you know, there it seems like it's just less shocking and people don't understand as well, perhaps, that this is not supposed to be happening. And of course, you know, you don't have the FEC enforcing things. You don't have a message coming from the powers that be that there are certain lines you should not cross. So some of the lines that still may exist is foreign money, right? And that makes it, it's easier to give foreign money. I didn't even get into that just because that's a whole nother dimension, but just you can drop money into a super PAC, but if they, if somebody intrepid finds out that China or Russia or you know Saudi Arabia is giving money to your super PAC, that could be a big problem for you. So that is one of those lines, but you need someone to investigate that and find that out. And it's not the FEC and it may not be the IRS. Jim asks, as we know, spending alone doesn't cause winning or losing in an election. Nevertheless, has anyone ever computed the statistical correlation between the amount spent and success? Oh, good question. Um, well, I'm sure somebody has. I unfortunately don't have it at my fingertips. But I would say you're absolutely right. You, you can't, you don't necessarily win the more you spend. But if you were to look over time and across all kinds of races, for sure, the race that is more well-funded is more likely to win, unless you either run a terrible campaign, which happens, and some people, you know, uh, Michael Bloomberg, uh, like Mike Bloomberg, or like, you know, Amy McGrath, who took on, you know, Mitch McConnell in Kentucky, I mean, she raised hundred million dollars. And, uh, I, you know, I'm sure Mitch McConnell could have had a hundred million dollars, but he probably didn't need a hundred million dollars because he was going to win in Kentucky, no matter what. Same with, uh, Jamie Harrison running against Lindsey Graham. I mean, it was just kind of a foregone conclusion. And so some people can raise a ton of money, um, Beto O'Rourke against Ted Cruz. I mean, you know, there are these races where they rake in millions and millions and millions of dollars, and that doesn't mean they don't spend them wisely and maybe they get closer or something, but there's just a foregone conclusion in some of these states. So I think that's an um, uh, example of you have a baked in, you know, plus red or plus blue, you know, plus 5% red or 5% blue that you're just not going to, you're not going to tip over. But don't you think at some point that just, it has to change. I mean, I don't know what that point is. And for each geographic area, it's probably different. But I mean, Ted Cruz was pretty outrageous during the Katanji Brown hearings. Now, he may be, I listened to a podcast yesterday that said he was playing to his base primarily to be able to get a clip for a television commercial. 
you know, he didn't let her answer any questions and he was posturing and, and, and they were classmates in, in Harvard Law School. So, but, <laughs> you know, I mean, he, do even the people that he represent get to a point where they're fed up? I mean, well, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, yes, yes and no. It'd be interesting. Um, uh, first of all, you know, he's, um, what, he's, he's not up till 2024, I think. So, um, and he's running for president. So uh, I think that his comments and the way he treated her and everything are more geared towards, you know, a presidential campaign. Um, do they get fed up? I mean, yes, people do get fed up, but you're talking about being from still pretty red states that are to an extent gerrymandered. Um, now, of course, you're not gerrymandered when you're running for Senate, but with, um, and I should have actually meant to focus more on some of the laws that are passing, uh, including in Texas about voting. So um, they're making it you know, harder to vote in certain uh, areas and rejecting more ballots and rejecting those ballots of people who might more, be more likely to vote against Ted Cruz. Um, so uh, there's, uh, you know, a lot of factors going on there. Um, and, um, you know, I think that there is uh, so much going on that is also, and this is just going far afield, but, you know, the, the quote unquote culture, the quote unquote grandstanding, uh, some of that has purchase, even if you don't agree 100% with everything that's going on, that's, that is, uh, you know, it gets um, people kind of riled up. And as much as you rile up people who don't like you, you also rile up people who do like you. And so I think that this, um, and that goes back to the, everybody's an independent operator and they're playing to a group that will support them. And then, uh, to people who will donate in large sums to, to help them because they're fomenting, uh, continuing on this, um, you know, this, this more uh, polarizing dimension. Um, and so I think it is challenging to think of ways to correct for that. And I think that that is some deep thinking is going on, which is really interesting um, about you know, what incentives do we have to how we pick our leaders and, and, you know, where can we sort of try to disincentize, disincent people to, um, you know, go off on these tangents and, and pay either some political price, like you're saying, or uh, just uh, be rewarded for moving a little away from some of that incendiary talk. And I mean, and it's, it's it's pretty alarming, but it's not as if we haven't had some periods of this in our in our recent past. And so you can talk at Father John Coughlin and uh, McCarthy and and other highly incendiary moments. And and somehow we've managed to steer away from them, and then we tend to kind of go back. And so I think this is. Um, you know, a, a bigger story. And of course you can roll in all kinds of new media and, and Twitter and social media and all of that. There was this amazing, I will just say, um, conference at the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago that was sponsored by the Atlantic and the Institute of Politics. They had uh, Barack Obama there, David Axelrod was speaking, um, a bunch of uh, journalists and um, it was, it was fascinating. You can watch it on YouTube and they had a lot to say about the media environment and how that foments this. So this is, this dark money is really one, one piece. Um, and there's a lot of pieces that I think it's hard to get your arms around, but you could imagine sort of moving in certain directions to try and change the incentives. Okay. Um, what, do you know, um, which lobby is the most powerful in the world right now or in the country? Um, no, I don't, I'm sure that, and this is, I think a good point to bring up that the lobbyists, I mean, so like, you know, pharmaceutical is very, very, very powerful. Certainly military defense contractors, very powerful. Um, uh, 
I, I couldn't say which is the most, and I think it depends on the issue at hand and, and who has access and, and what they're able to block and or, or push for. Um, but this is a little bit separate from what we were talking about. I think we want to be really clear. This is really funding of campaigns and lobbying, um, you know, is also there's money, there's influence, of course, that's, you know, let's not be naive, but um, that's more still above board. If you're getting money from the pharmaceuticals, you're still disclosing that because you're getting it from their pack and you're getting, you know, hard money contributions and that is disclosed. And there may be some piece of this, but if Pfizer or if, um, you know, Raytheon or something is found out to have been giving tons of money un, uh, totally anonymously or huge dollars way outside the limits, that's going to be a real problem for them. It's not a problem for George Soros or Sheldon Adelson, who recently passed away, or the Koch brothers, because that's not their, they're not a public, they're not you know, trying to have a reputation that the public, they want good image. So that's a little different. Okay. Uh, what does a group like Emily's List, or where does a group like Emily's List fit in the dark money spectrum? Is it oh. governed by a 501c or c4 rules? No, it's a PAC. It's okay. a PAC. So Emily's List, just in case people don't know, there's no Emily. It stands for early money is like yeast. It makes the dough rise. So Emily's List is, uh, again, for people who don't know, is a group that gives money to um, largely, pro, well, exclusively pro-choice candidates and now almost exclusively Democratic. They used to give sometimes pro-choice group uh, candidates on the Republican side, but they're, I think, no longer. Um, and they raise money and it's hard money. And so they, you know, get a lot of money, they back candidates. And the the, the brilliance of uh, Ellen Malcolm when she set it up in 1985 um, was that, um, and especially they promote women candidates almost exclusively too, is that women had trouble raising money as candidates and that if they could demonstrate themselves to Emily's list that they were viable candidates, then other people would donate. So if you can say, you know, again, I'm running for dog catcher and I say, well, Emily's list supports me because I'm going to be good <laughs> about, you know, spaying and neutering all our dogs. Um, then I could go back to all the Levy Center and they said, well, if Emily, Emily's list supports you, that is a, you know, imprimatur that we would. Um, so uh, they've had a huge impact in getting more women to run, uh, training them, raising money for them. Uh, I forgot the numbers, but tens of millions of dollars each, each cycle. They're very, very successful. Um, but they're not dark money. They are above board money. You can look at the money they've raised, who it goes to, they're giving it in, you know, support. Um, uh, so uh, they're an entity and there's equal entities on the Republican side that do that. So there's a, a whole universe of groups that are doing this, that are separate from the super PACs and the 501c4s and those groups. And it is a very murky. And I could tell you, you know, it, it's very hard to be 100% clear because the, the lines keep getting blurred and the rules change. And, and who, you know, it, it's very hard to keep track. So I just wanted to give a general overview, but tomorrow it could change a little bit and be a little bit different. <laughs> Would um, taking away the tax exemption for political donations make any difference? Well, let's, okay, again, let's be careful. So if you give your money to Emily's List, you're not getting a tax write-off. That is a political organization. You give it to, you know, Planned Parenthood or ACLU and they're lobbying and they're advocating, they, you're not getting a tax write-off. You're only getting a tax write-off if you give it to, um, a, a 501c3 and then like through one of these donor advised funds. So you give it to, you know, some nonprofit and then that nonprofit turns around and gives it to a 501c4 that then can be used for uh, lobbying. 
but you're you're supposed to be when you're only getting a tax write off for donating to groups that are doing something that has that educational, charitable, religious mission. So, yeah. Um, in light of the Citizens United decision, is there anything Congress could do if it weren't so divided to place some reasonable limits on campaign contributions that wouldn't be struck down by the Supreme Court? Excellent question. Um, That's from Neil. Um, yes, you could, of course, you know, and they've tried with the Freedom to Vote Act, there was attempts to um, include, you know, like public funding of elections, you could do that. Um, and, and I think the um, Disclose Act, again, going back to at least you have to disclose who's donating. I don't think it seems like, especially with the Supreme Court, that putting limits um, in, in certain ways is going to pass muster and they're never going to, uh, it doesn't seem like, uh, strike down these outside groups, the super PACs and all of that. So, but you could clean them up a little bit. You also, of course, could imagine um, a stronger or better organized FEC that would start to crack down on uh, things that are pushing boundaries and find ways that these mon the money is flowing in all directions and, and, and you know, make that harder to do. Um, so I think on the margins and, and um, some uh, uh, 24 cities actually and 14 states have set up some kind of small don donor uh, matching so that would encourage people to donate and then, you know, you get matched. Um, but that's going to be, um, you know, depends on the candidates. If you happen to run against a very wealthy candidate, you know, no amount of money you raise from small dollars is going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, out outweigh that. Um, on the other hand, as we've talked about, just just raising the most money doesn't guarantee you a win. And actually, um, last point on this, and that would be, uh, you know, a topic for another day, perhaps, but, but certainly we're seeing that more and more districts are voting the way they vote in the, in the presidential. So again, you know, just if you're a Democrat running in a more red Republican leaning district that voted for Trump for president, and you raise a ton more money than the Republican, you're still running uphill because people, the vote has become more nationalized. The ticket splitting that we used to see where you'd vote for your Democratic congressperson, but your Republican presidential candidate, that's uh, way, gone way down. There's very few, very few people or few districts where that happens now. So um, you're, build, you're, you're running into that sort of structural partisanship. Uh. Several of the um, comments have been very complimentary of, you know, thanking you for the explanation. Uh, but there's also, there also been a few comments where people are just um, sad, exasperated, maybe a little depressed. Um, what, you know, this feeling of helplessness, what, what can the average person do? Um, I, I can, you know, most of the people listening to you right now are not wealthy and um, not, not at a super PAC level. What can we do? I mean, we vote, we stay aware, we listen to subject matter experts like yourself, but I hear them 100%. I agree. It's dispiriting. I am 100% with you. It is um, uh, dismaying. Um, I think the first thing is obviously um, understanding how it works, and that is important. I will say um, that um, supporting uh, institutions, if you're so inclined, is important. And, and that could be, you know, political parties um, in, in, in states that you support or um, uh, institutions like, you know, League of Women Voters, things that educate voters, register voters, 
uh, that watchdog groups that uh, are watching all of this, that are out there, um, that have uh, followed this open secrets is one that catalogs where all the money is. Uh, 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 public citizen, um, there's others that are cataloging this and they're all nonprofits looking for some support and some strengthening. And they are really um, uh, watching and trying to uh, report and shine some sunlight on this. So I think that, yes, it is uh, despairing uh, in certain instances, but I think that the institutions, uh, it maybe needs a little bit of a rebalance and um, uh, public opinion and some understanding of how this works and then strengthening those institutions that uh, can get people involved and educated and, and participating. And the more people who vote, I mean, the, this, the one, not the one positive, there are positives, but I will want to leave people with the idea that remember in 2020 was the highest voter turnout we've had in over a hundred years. And so, and there were attempts to uh, you know, certainly make it a little more difficult to vote. And we had a pandemic. I mean, like, you know, uh, if ever there was a reason to say, maybe I'm not going to stand in line with people and, you know, risk getting sick and and people not wanting to be judges and, and especially uh, people who are um, a little older, who are at more risk, especially with the first wave of COVID and uh, still took chances to uh, monitor elections and be election judges and all of that. Um, you know, that is really, really powerful. And, um, and, and, and if you vote, you create a habit of voting. And so the more people that are encouraged to vote, educated about how to register, make sure you're not purged from voting rolls, um, that may be less of an issue in, you know, some states than others, but that's a, that's a big issue. Uh, all of that can be very um, important and, and people win by narrow margins. And so votes really do matter. So as much as all this is, you know, disheartening um, and, and overwhelming and maybe a little eye-opening as how it somewhat works, um, you know, there still is, uh, and, and, and the jury is out in terms of how much these laws about voting are going to really have an impact because sometimes that just galvanizes people to turn out and vote. And if you vote and your ballot is not rejected and you, or you cure your ballot and you stay on it and you vote, or, you know, vote early and sign up for absentee ballots. And so you get a ballot every election and you send it back. All of that is still undeniable and that is gonna be counted. So I think that is uh, where I would put my energies in terms of trying to shore up those institutions and those groups trying to do that kind of work and um, hope that it it turns the tide a little bit and gets people and the, and the young generation are very active uh, for the most part and very, um, I think, motivated. So that is also encouraging. So I hope I, you know. No, that, I Thank you. That was very, um, very helpful. And um, as you were speaking, Jennifer sent in a message, join League of Women Voters, Reform for Illinois, and Common Cause. So those are all good groups to investigate and see where you line up and absolutely um, do that good work. And, and, you know, there's nothing, I mean, as much as this is dispiriting, you know, getting people engaged and really committed to this is 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 so worthwhile and so valuable. And even if it doesn't work the first time, you know, it lays the groundwork going forward. Great. Thank you, Julie. This was really fascinating. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you, Levy Senior Center Foundation. Please join us back here in two weeks. Gary Wenstrup will be here to give us a one hour, hour historical summary of the Beatles. Stay tuned. Julie's lecture will be up on YouTube later this evening or early tomorrow. Um, it will be up for two weeks only. And um, if you need to, if you want to watch it again or share it with people who have not, that's your time frame. Thanks so much, Julie. It was wonderful. Thank you, um, thank so you much. again. My pleasure. Take care. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.